Welcome to this Frontline Club event. I'm Pranvira Smith, one of the founders of the Frontline Club. Please join us every Thursday at 3 p.m. for future discussions. We're delighted that both Christina and Lindsay are able to join in. Lindsay will take over now to explain for the details. Christina, while Lindsay joins in, welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It's great to be here. This is the first time of doing anything like this. So and um, I gather we have lots of people from all over the world joining us. So that's fantastic. Um, well, we will and take let's hope the technology works. We will take a couple more minutes and uh, because there's still people joining in. And Lindsay is just coming back again. So <laughs> I think she went to check on her newts. <laughs> Hi, Lindsay. Hi, Sandra. We are waiting for Christine. Perfect. You're on. Oh. Okay, let's give uh, Christine, uh, uh, let's give Lindsay a bit more time. I think she, I think it's the internet is obviously an overload everywhere. <laughs> okay, so we'll get, uh, we'll get Lindsay sorted in a second. Um, so Christina, tell me you are in London. A uh, oh, beautiful bookshelf behind you. Where are you? So I'm in South London at home in my office. Uh, yeah, lots of books and um, trying to get used to being a foreign correspondent who can't travel anywhere, which is uh, slightly disconcerting. I hope it doesn't last too long. Um, and like everybody else trying to get uh, used to this strange new normality of not really being able to leave the house very much and mostly reporting virtually like this and reporting on my own city and own country rather than for the first time actually in my whole career because I've always been a foreign correspondent. Well, I happened to attend uh, what must have been the last book launch in London, which was the launch of your book. It was. It was on the 12th of March and I think it was the last book launch and we were actually joking that evening about passing around canapes and hand sanitizers. and then a group of us went to an Italian restaurant in solidarity with Italy. I think still not really thinking that this was going to happen here too. I don't know. Looking back you think what on earth were we thinking of? We must have realised but I think when we criticised rightly the politicians for not being more prepared. Um, maybe we should remember that many of us too also weren't really thinking this was going to happen to us. I think yeah, Lindsay is back. back up. So, um, let me... oh. I apologize for those of you who saw me and then I disappeared. Anyway, look, it's great to be at this event. I'm very excited. Um, I'm wearing makeup for the first time in four weeks and, you know, a proper shirt and a scarf and, uh, you know, obviously I'm not going to, I'm not going to show you the shorts I'm wearing underneath the desk. And um, it's great because we're joined by, I just asked for a list of where you all were. I can't see you. Normally the frontline event, I see you. But the great thing about this is that we're joined by people from Hong Kong, Australia, the US, South Africa, Oman, Italy, um, Abu Dhabi, as well as, of course, uh, the UK. And so um, it's the, uh, the book. We are going to talk about the book. But first of all, you know, you and I are trying to be correspondent who can't get on a plane. 
yeah, it's a very strange situation and I um, really find myself reporting on, I mean, I like you, I mostly report on conflicts and disasters and now I'm reporting on that in my own country, which is a little bit disconcerting. You, you did a very good report the other week. You, in, you did a profile of um, Dr. Knott. Tell us a bit about, about this Dr. Knott because he kind of spans out the world, doesn't he? So Dr. Knott, um, some of you may have come across, is this amazing doctor. He's a trauma surgeon actually, who has um, every year for more than 25 years gone abroad on his holidays and gone to war zones really and worked in hospitals helping people. And then in more recent years, he started training uh, doctors in places so that they um, have the skills to work in these situations. And in particular in, in Syria, in some of the hospitals in places like Aleppo under siege, um, so he's a, a really brave and amazing man who's worked in really, really difficult situations and seen terrible things. And he now is working in a hospital in London, in Paddington, so actually very near the Frontline Club, and so in the intensive care unit with COVID-19 patients. So he was comparing i mean i think some of these comparisons with war are a little bit overblown but he was talking about just how difficult the situation is and how traumatic it is particularly for young doctors and nurses just seeing so many people dying and also dealing with something where you just don't know how patients are going to react where some people um, react in one way and other people their whole system kind of very quickly collapses so it was really brought home talking to him and particularly when he said he found it actually as traumatic as when he was working in Aleppo and lots of children were being uh, killed and maimed by barrel bombs dropped by the Assad regime um, and he talked also about the uh, mental strain on the nurses and doctors and how difficult that is for them and what it's going to be like actually afterwards when, um, are trying to um, process what they've been through because as other people that have been in these situations will know it's actually afterwards that it's often harder. Yeah I mean I think that that's a really interesting point because also you know with, with And country, of course, you know, many, you know, um, Congolese, whoever reporting on their own countries, but we're the kind of correspondent who goes somewhere else. As us, which is a very, a very sort of different and strange. I'm sorry, I can't hear you, Lindsay. Oh. I don't know if you've just asked me a question. What what are you reading in lockdown? What am I reading in lockdown? Well, I read a lot always. Um, mostly I read novels. I mean, I read lots of nonfiction about things and areas that I'm working on, but for relaxation I, I read novels I read a lot I always have lots of books on my bedside table um, I'm not feeling that this is a time where I should read all those books I thought I ought to read like the complete works of Proust or something like that um, so at the moment well actually I've just finished a really good book which was called The Disappearance of Joseph Mengele which is a uh, a book by a French author called Olivier Guess, um, which I'm probably pronouncing wrong, um, which I don't think has been published in England yet. I was sent a proof copy, but I think it's coming out soon. And um, it's about Mengele's life um, 
hiding in Argentina and then in Brazil. Um, it's absolutely fascinating. It's a really brilliant book. And now I'm just about to start Vasily Grossman's book, Life and ah. Fates in Stalingrad. Yes, that, <laughs> that one's on my uh, shelf. Um, quite, um, it's quite a seriously big book, that. Yeah. Well, I'm sort of toying between that and Girl, Woman, Other, Bernadine oh, yeah. Everest's book, which won lots of prizes, including the Booker Prize. So, um, so I've got both of them. I decide tonight which I'll start first. Okay, well, listen, I've just started Caroline Criado Perez's book, Invisible Women, which is very relevant to your book, of course. So she's talking, she's writing about how data excludes women and that he is assumed to account for all of us, male, female alike. And of course, that's very relevant to your book because your book is about a history of war that has not been written before because war tends to be written about by men and from a male perspective and so that's why this horrific part of war sexual crime in war has frequently just not been mentioned tell but it's such a difficult painful subject tell us why did you decide to write this book I wrote this book because I was angry. <laughs> um, I felt that I kept seeing these terrible things happening to women and they were not getting coverage, they were not really, nobody seemed to be doing very much about them and I also felt that I've been doing this job for 33 years now and I've seen more brutality against women in the last few years than at any time in my career. And that didn't seem to make sense, that why should this be getting worse? And I didn't think it was that I'd become more aware of it, because as a woman correspondent, I've always talked to women when I'm in war zones and about what's happened to them. So it really did seem to me that it was getting worse. Um, so I started, I became quite obsessed about it. To be completely honest, it was quite difficult getting stories in my paper, The Sunday Times, about um, this subject. I had a male editor, a male foreign editor, a male head of news. Um, fortunately, the Sunday Times magazine editor, Eleanor Mills, was a great sort of advocate of, and she's chairman of Women in Journalism, of um of some of these stories and issues so i was able to write in in the magazine but it wasn't something that was easy to to cover and i um just started to kind of talk to more and more people about it and was really shocked at just how bad the situation was and how little we seemed to know about it but it's interesting that you say that you feel it was getting worse and you were coming across it more and yet one thing that comes out from your book is that this is a crime in war that has existed in for all time yes and i mean it's so, always been a feature yeah. of war well that's true i mean if you go back to sort of you know the ancient greeks and persians and romans um yeah there was always rape in war and in fact herodotus you know the first written book of um, history in the west starts with pages about sort of abdu abductions of women by the greeks by the phoenicians um so it's true that it isn't something new but it doesn't seem to me to make it that it's something we shouldn't care about or that it's something that should still keep happening it is a war crime um and the places that i looked at i really looked at how it was not just happening in the chaos of war but it was actually specifically being used as a weapon of war and that i think is something that we're seeing more more recently i think that i mean that there was a um a phrase which i was in the book where you said Rape is as much a weapon of war as the machete club or Kalashnikov. What, what did you mean by that? 
because it's actually a very effective weapon of war. If you um, rape a lot of women in an area, you humiliate the men who feel that they've not been able to protect the women. You may use it as a way of ethnically cleansing the area that people then all, all flee. Um, sometimes it's to try and change the ethnic balance so they actually want to impregnate the women and um, create new kind of change the, the, the balance um, and so it you know it's a, a way of forcing people to leave an area of terrorizing an area humiliating people um, and it doesn't cost anything I mean it's cheaper than a bullet if you like I are you for writing this book because obviously I've come across this but I, I sort of can't bear it, you know. It's like seeing as you to because I find it so difficult to to dwell in that space for a long time. How did you how did you manage to do that, to cope with all these terrible stories you were hearing? Well, I think because I, you know, felt angry that it was happening and I wanted to change things. And I thought actually it's giving a platform. So the book is very much written in the voices of the women. I don't paraphrase their stories. I tell the stories in their words. Um, and I went to lots and lots of different places because one of the things that became clear as I started um, investigating it more I mean, honestly, I could have written this book forever, I think, because unfortunately it's happening in so many places. And as I was investigating, I just, I wanted to show the scale of it. And that's why, you know, I could have chosen to just tell a few very powerful stories, but actually I, I wanted to have a lot of stories from a lot of different places to just bring home to people that this is something happening on a wide scale and it's not going to stop until people do something about it and people are brought to justice. So it was difficult to write, it was difficult to listen to the stories, not as difficult by any means as for them to tell the stories or for, you know, for what they've gone through. And so that very much was what was motivating me that, you know, they, Quite a few of the women, you know, it, when they were telling me their stories, I was saying to them, you know, do you want to stop? Because it's so hard to talk about some of these things. And, and they would say things like, you know, um, no, I want to tell my story because I don't want anybody to be able to say they didn't know. And so I felt it was very important to do it. in that I think it's a very important uh, book in that way what do you want to read us a little bit is there one particular story you can you can read us maybe I can read you a bit um, where I where it first really came home to me what was going on and yeah. that I thought we needed to do something so this is Actually, I was covering a lot the refugee crisis in 2015-2016 and I was um, going quite a lot to the Greek islands, which was, as you know, where lots of people came by in these overcrowded dinghies to Turkey. And I went to this very strange Greek island called Leros, which actually was a place that Mussolini had turned into a... a a naval base at one point and so it's full of all this sort of um, Italian fascist architecture which is rather strange on this Greek island yeah. so it was an odd place um, and so I met some of the refugees so I'll just read a little bit from that. When I look back to that summer on the tiny Greek island of Leros to the derelict mental asylum littered with pigeon droppings and rusting iron bedsteads where I first met the Yazidis. I still see the girl's eyes so deep and troubled and pleading. She is thrusting her phone at me to show me a video. 
I could see an iron cage with perhaps a dozen young women inside and Arabic men crowded around jeering, Kalashnikovs on their shoulders. At first, I don't understand. The women look petrified. Then the men step back, flames engulf the cage. There are screams and the video ends. That is my sister, said the girl. They are burning virgins alive. Everything seems to stop and spin. I don't know if the sound in my head is the sea outside or blood rushing to my ears. Sun is pouring through a hole in the roof and sweat running down our faces. A small Yazidi child is trailing through the rubble and broken glass and downed rafters singing to herself, a waif of a thing with strands of hair stuck to her cheeks like fronds. She's getting closer and closer to a large crater in the floorboards until in panic I yank her away. Her mother, resting against a stone wall next to the girl whose sister was burnt alive, stares blankly ahead. What has happened to these people? I want to get out of that asylum with its barred windows and stained walls. Through the bars, I could see down below, row upon row of white prefab containers surrounded by wire, concertina fence, and beyond that, the Aegean Sea, jarring in its deep blue perfection. The camp where these Yazidis are living is more than a thousand miles from their homeland under the tall sacred mountain between Iraq and Syria, on which they believe Noah's Ark came to rest. I had never met Yazidis before that. Their, their religion is one of the world's most ancient, but like most people, the first I'd heard of them was at the end of the summer in 2014, when I saw pictures of thousands trapped on that mountain where they had fled convoy after convoy of black clad ISIS fighters intent on exterminating them. In the ruins of that asylum, that sweltering August day, one after another came forward from the shadows to tell me their stories, stories that shook my very core worse than anything I had heard in three decades as a foreign correspondent. So that sort of explains that, how I started. Yeah. Well, that's pretty, that's pretty terrifying because in three decades as a foreign correspondent, you've seen some pretty awful things. So you and they told it. me about um, yeah. a village in Germany where they said uh, a lot of the Yazidi women had been taken, a secret village, which of course as a journalist my eyes or ears pricked up. Um, it turned out not to be a secret village but lots of shelters in a particular state in Germany. So I went there and talked to some of the women and one of them who was the niece of Nadia Murad who then won the Nobel Peace Prize later on um, this girl was just 16 and she told me that she had been taken by an ISIS judge and raped every night by him and he was very fat and he would um, force himself on her. But then she said that the worst night of her life was the night when he brought back a, a 10 year old girl who and raped that girl in the room next to hers and she listened to the girl crying for her mother the whole night. That is just, it, it's horrific. But the Yazidis, one of the things about the Yazidis which you, you mentioned is that there, there has been no justice, even though we're several years on. And I mean, I think many people in this audience will be familiar of, you know, terrible stories of rape in Rwanda. There has been some justice or moves towards justice, but for the Yazidi women, nothing. No, and that was the thing that really shocked me because you know you can't say that nobody knew what was happening. I'm reading that story, but you people listening will know that what happened to the Yazidis it got lots of coverage, um, and yet despite that there was no justice not a single person has been prosecuted for um abducting and uh raping yazidi girls even though thousands and there's plenty of evidence there even i've even seen paperwork you know which shows um when one a girl was sold from one 
man to another and it's almost like the selling of a, a car you know with, and it says product five foot four girl hazel eyes um you know and so there's plenty of um evidence and as you know i mean isis put lots of the things they did on video so you, you wouldn't think it was difficult to um prosecute them but the will isn't there um and that if you go back through recent history you see that again and again and after the second world war um in any conflict where there has been large-scale sexual conflict that no one has been brought to justice afterwards yeah so tell me a bit about the Rwandans though because I mean obviously this is a country that's close to my heart because I spent a lot of time there and also a lot of time with women who were raped in Rwanda and the children of women who were raped but you found a very women tell us a bit about them so uh, Rwanda is fascinating because there is these four um, women that I spoke to who surviving of a original group of five who literally um, risked their lives to go and, and testify against the mayor of their small town called Taba, not far outside of Kigali. And um, they were the first people or to bring anybody to justice internationally. So the first time that rape was convicted as a war crime was because of these four Rwandan, very simple, uh, illiterate Rwandan women who went and had never been out of the country before, never really been out of their area hardly, um, and yet went to the tribunal in Arusha and told their stories. But even that is fascinating because the the case against this mayor, Jean Paul Akayesu, when it started, he wasn't being tried for sexual violence or for anything like that. It was um, it, for torture and for murder, which many people think is more important to to convict after war. And that's the problem that obviously for these women. This is something that's basically going to ruin the rest of their life. So it is as important that they, there be justice for that as there is for um, the killings and the torture. And so in this case, a woman started talking about what had happened to her. And she said, and, and then I was raped. And literally the judge said, well, you know, we're not interested in that. Let's <laughs> move on. Kind of thing. And fortunately, one of the three judges was a woman, an amazing South African woman called Navi Pile. Um, and she said, well, hang on a minute. You know, this woman's come all the way here to let's properly hear her story. And it was only because that female judge started asking more questions and then realized that there was something more to this so they actually then halted the whole trial and then reframed it and issued new charges against Akayesu and um, and in 1998 he was convicted of a number of things but it included sexual violence yeah it's two things really strike me on that one first of all you know i testified in the Akayesu trial that I was one of the, because uh, I was I was not a witness to what he had done, but I was because I was one of only a couple of journalists in Rwanda at the time. I testified to um, the genocide, the crimes against humanity being widespread and systematic, and that was because his was the very first case that was tried. So I was very interested in in that story that you told. But also because the fact that it was a female judge, that female prosecutor, right? That that seemed to me really important. And you found that in other places as well, didn't you? In the judicial yeah. system, women being in the judicial system is rather significant. 
it makes all the difference. I mean, and almost every, and you know, we're still talking about few convictions. I mean, most people, when they think about this subject, think about Bosnia, right, in the 90s, because there was lots of coverage of, of the rape camps and all the terrible things that were done. Um, and then there were trials afterwards, and, and there were some convictions, but actually when, when not that many convictions for, for rape, considering the widespread nature of it. And, um, and I met some amazing women in Bosnia who to this day are trying to track down the people, the perpetrators, and bring them to justice, and they go around trying to find them. And they're very frustrated because they, you know, they say some of these people you can run into in coffee shops, they're living free lives, and some of them are even working as policemen. <laughs> um, and it's extremely difficult to bring them to justice. And one of the problems is, and you'll know that from that trial, that sometimes the prosecutors, they know very well what was going on, but they fear that the case will, if they get bogged down, as they kind of put it in, in the sexual violence, that they'll lose the other case that they think is more important, prosecuting for genocide. So, and I personally think that, you know, once you've met these women and they tell their stories and almost all of them say that they wish they'd died, that what happened to them was worse. So how can you then say it's not as important to prosecute for this as it is for the killing? Absolutely. Before we go, there was another, case in the book which I found really touching because it was it was in Bangladesh and these women they were basically old ladies and yet who had been raped in 1972 at the, the time of the you know the Indo-Pakistan war which had created the war which created Bangladesh and I I found them and their their stories incredibly um touching and upsetting tell us a bit about about these women who are what in many of them in their in their 70s or even 80s yeah. now. So, so I came across that because I was in Bangladesh when the Rohingyas um, started coming there. And so I was interviewing Rohingya women um, who, you know, again, horrific stories of how they'd been um, taken in the middle of the night from their hearts by Burmese soldiers and tied to banana trees and gang raped in front of their children and you know absolutely awful stories and then I was talking to a Bangladeshi man who lived in the area one day who'd fought in the um, war of liberation and he said well of course this happened here too so I said well what do you mean and then he said you know I feel very bad because all I am always treated as a hero because I fought in this war. But he said, what happened to our women um, who were raped by so many of the Pakistani um, army that came there um, was so awful. And yet they don't get any recognition. In fact, they have to hide away. And he referred to them as like the women who, who stare at nothing. And, so I then thought I would go and try and talk to some of the, the women. And it's quite difficult because they have basically had to live most of their life in shame. And this is a big problem with, I mean, rape in general, but in war rape in many of these places, that it's the victim who is stigmatized rather than the perpetrator. And so in Bangladesh, it's a very interesting case because when independence came, first at the beginning, these women were recognized by Sheikh Majib, the independence leader, and he even gave them a, a title, Birangona, um, which was meant to recognize them as war heroes. Unfortunately, he was, so at the beginning, they were kind of, um, fated and given allowances and centers were were open for them but then he was assassinated not that long afterwards and everything changed and sudden and the centers were closed down and these women were treated really badly and castigated and um, basically had to live the rest of their lives 
in shame. Um, and so I met some of the women who were living in a, a small town about seven hours drive from Dhaka, the capital, um, amazing women. And they had something which they called the Mother's Club, which was sort of uh, where they would meet in each other's huts and talk about and sort of support each other. Um, and they just had horrendous stories of things that had happened to them, but their whole lives had been destroyed as a result of it. And recently there's been a change again, and now people are encouraging them to come forward and so that they can get a pension. One of them had come forward and her daughter um, had then been furious with her because she said, you've brought shame on the whole family and that the daughter's husband had left her because he said, how could, you know, your mother is a whore, or a prostitute that she slept with Pakistani soldiers. And, um, and so really awful story. That's terrific. So what, so where do you get your hope from, Christina, <laughs> in writing this book? Or, or did you not find any hope? Well, as I said before, I wrote it because I thought at least if I put it all down, no one can say they didn't know. And it actually brings home how widespread it is. And, and the same thing happening in more and more places. And that, like I said, I, could have, I kept finding more countries where it's happening that I don't even include. But there is hope because there's also some amazing heroic people, not just women. There's some men in it who are incredible and people like, uh, Dr. McQuaggy in Congo, who won the Nobel Peace Prize last year with Nadia Murad, who's um, treated maybe 54,000 women who've been raped. And it's just the most just amazing man because he, although he's a, a doctor, a gynecologist, actually, he really realizes that it's not just about medical treatment, that there's many more things. So he set up this whole program, a very holistic program of, um, of support for them and also not just like psychological support but also enabling them to make a livelihood so education for them and small um, loans so they can set up businesses because often they're um, ostracized from their communities and also encouraging them to take legal action if they want to and to kind of tell their story and own their story so um, so he's remarkable there's um, so the book you know has quite a number of people in it who are doing heroic things and it's not a completely bleak picture because actually the last couple of years there have started to be some successful cases and it's more I mean the thing that makes me very angry is the International Criminal Court because they have not convicted a single person the only one they ever convicted was um, Jean-Pierre Bemba the Congolese warlord for what his forces did in the Central African Republic and then they overturned that verdict so they have not convicted anybody um, which is you know that's so bad because it, you need some high level convictions here to set an example otherwise it's just going to keep happening as it is more and more but some of the national courts now there have been success in places like latin america um sometimes it's taken really long time so there's this group of guatemalan grandmothers who i um who were kidnapped and um, sexually assaulted, basically used as sex slaves in during the civil war there about 36 years ago. And finally, they got a conviction a couple of years ago. But they, those women had had to testify, tell their stories about 22 times before. Oh. Um, so, you know, it, it's really difficult. And so the people that managed to get and again, there, there was a female prosecutor and a female judge in the end involved. But um, it, the women that come forward that do this, what they go through is just completely unbelievable. And they're really my heroes. We've got some questions which have come in on the Q&A thing, written questions. So let me put a couple of those to you first. I, here from Emma Parkin, she asks, 
what do you hope for your book to achieve? Is there any kind of objective that you have in mind that these interviews and stories could help support? Well, two things. I mean, I want people to know so that people start to try and do something about it. And, you know, as I said, it is a war crime. It has been a war crime for more than 100 years. It's time we start doing something about it. We shouldn't just say, oh, well, it always happens in war and it's awful and um, but not do anything about it um, but also I think there are some things to learn because actually what I found talking to organizations helping women in different countries that there doesn't seem to be a lot of interaction between them so for example um, the Congolese um, city of joy in Bukava which is an amazing project they now talking about how they've discovered that um, getting the women farming and working, uh, growing things is so helpful. And yet the women I spoke to from Srebrenica, um, that really helped them. They started growing roses and, um, mm. and they found that incredibly helpful. But that was like 15 years ago they discovered that. And you sort of think that everybody's sort of going through the same process and discovering the same things are helpful. But they shouldn't need to spend years doing it because other people have done it before them. So I hope that there's some also useful information of, of what can help and what works. And also just things like, as we were talking about, you know, having a woman on the bench in, in these court mm. cases makes a huge difference. And, you know, they should be, be there. Absolutely. I mean, another question we've got here from Ash Gupta. He talks about William Hague, you know, who was the foreign secretary here, and Angelina Jolie. They campaigned against sexual violence in conflict. Were they effective in any way? Did that, there was a big conference here. Um, yeah. Did that make any difference? Well, there's been some criticism of that, that they spent a lot of money having a, a conference. Um, and what did it actually achieve? I mean, I, the UK is the first country where the foreign secretary actually made this a key part of foreign policy started a department in the foreign office um, and actually i mean william Hague was every meeting that he had every bilateral he raised this issue and you know and so people knew other foreign ministers knew that he was going to talk about it and that they needed to sort of look into it so and he says lots of people said to him you're a man, why are you interested in this? <laughs> um, but, and so what he did do was raise the profile of it internationally and with Angelina Jolie. I'm not sure that that much concrete was achieved as a result of it, not least because subsequent foreign secretaries, um, including our uh, current prime minister, were less interested <laughs> in the issue and cut back the department quite a lot. So it went from having 45 people to, I think it now has three people. Um, so, you know, what they can do with that number of people is obviously much less, but they are, I mean, I know the people involved and they are, you know, still trying to very hard to, to make a difference and keep it, you know, William Hague talked of it as a, as a sort of national security issue. Yeah. And the British military now have uh, um, taken it up and they have um, courses at Shrivenham where they train um, military from other countries that come over. And, and, and this is a very much an important part of, of yeah, the training. And I hope, yeah, and I hope that your book will become required reading on those courses. <laughs> it should be, definitely. Now, we're going to try and take a live question which um, technologically makes me very anxious um, <laughs> and I understand it's from John the lovely John Owen now in Oregon late of this parish but now um, in a more glorious setting John let's John. see if we can hear you my goodness from Bend oh. Oregon I am asking you a question it's great to see you both and uh, uh, anyway, um, it's not the same as sitting in the Frontline Club with a glass of wine and um, waiting to talk to you both, but you're as usual in great form. And that's my question, actually. While you're talking about well, what you're discussing this, and while the world's media are obsessed, rightly, 
with the coronavirus, where are the bad guys now going to be doing terrible things that get ah. no safety, no coverage? And how do you try to figure out how we can still get that reporting? Because it's a great time to be doing atrocious things, the kind of things that Christine has been talking about. Yes, we, we have a phrase for it, don't we? Uh, a good day to bury bad news. And, uh, and in fact, John, I'm, I'm working on a story at the moment. Christina and I were talking about it this morning. And I'm doing a story, I hope, for next week on all the terrible things that people are getting away with because we're, we're looking the other right. way. W one of which is, you know, continued hostility between Iran and the US, you know, belligerent talk and firing of missiles and bringing each other's you know, ships, warships near each other. China, all sorts of shit in the South China Sea and menacing Taiwan, you know, just taking advantage and then, you know, on a, you know, and then people doing the things that they normally do, like the Saudis having unfair trials. And, um, you know, there's just, um, as you know, Netanyahu trying to get out of being brought to justice. All of this stuff goes on, but it's very hard to get a country like the UK, which is traumatized at the moment, understandably, when you, you fear that your own granny is going to die in a care home, it's very hard to get people to look at terrible things happening elsewhere. Um, you know, if you're going to do anything from elsewhere, people want something that might give them a bit of cheer. Christina, have you, yeah. have you got an answer? Also, because also we can't go anywhere. I mean, you know, I'm reporting from Stoke Newington. <laughs> yes. Um, hi, John, great to hear from you. Uh, we miss you. I wish so, I could show you my view of the Deschutes River right now, but I can't. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, as Lindsay said, we've been talking about it because I think both of us and other colleagues feel very strongly concerned that, you know, we are ignoring other issues. The world hasn't stopped while coronavirus is happening and bad things are still going on. We just had the World Food Programme yesterday talking about the number of people facing famine might be 265 million people this year, which is just, you know, unbelievable. You've got the locust, I mean, we now have this kind of plague. They're also talking about the locust plague that they've had in East Africa coming back again. You've still got fighting in Afghanistan and Yemen. Um, I mean, some places this has focused minds and people are not fighting as much, but I'm afraid in other places, um, Afghanistan will be very high on that mm. list. Um, it, it, fighting's going on as much as ever. And that's very sad that you would hope that one result of all of this might be that it would focus minds a bit about what are we all doing to each other and perhaps we should be thinking more as a community and as people are talking about you know we now seeing what it's like to have clear air and birds in our gardens that that makes us think more about the environment in the same way uh, this should make us think more about some of the bad things that are happening in the world. But it's true that some people are taking advantage of this to, to hide things. And we saw Pakistan recently um, trying to release the killer of Daniel Pearl, I'm presumably thinking that it wasn't going to be noticed with all of this happening. Fortunately, it was. And he, there's now an appeal to stop him being released. But... Um, I feel very strongly that we mustn't forget what's happening elsewhere, but it's hard. Um, I understand that yeah. people, you know, are very focused on what's happening to ourselves. Thank you. Great, uh, great, great to hear from you. And from I miss you. Let me, before we come up, let me put, we'll go over one which has been written here. Um, which is what is is Kay Jones has asked this, and this is one of the most difficult issues, uh, Christina. Do you have a theory on what makes men able to inflict 
such pain and suffering on women. That's really difficult. When I was writing the book, of course, it was something that I thought about a lot of the time. I mean, how could people do such terrible things? What possible enjoyment could anybody get from, from doing this? Um, actually, I talked to Anthony Beaver, the great military historian who, um, of course, in his book on Berlin, wrote very movingly and about what happened to women in Berlin when the Russians came in to liberate Berlin and as many as two million German women were raped. Um, and, you know, it, it's something that he said really disturbed him and that he wondered, you know, if there is a dark side in all men that might come out in a situation like that. Um, so I tried to interview male perpetrators which probably is a subject for a whole other book um, but it was not very easy to do and the ones that I met which were in were ISIS members who were in Kurdish prisons um, I think all the way through doing the book it was an advantage being a woman talking to the women however talking to the men about what they'd done to the women it I'm sure was not an advantage at all to be a female correspondent um, and and they did denied that they they said like their cousins had done it or their commanders or their brothers um, and they wouldn't any of them talk about themselves having done these things so that was not really very useful at the end of the day and actually there's very little research surprisingly done on, on um, this and um, why because you know it, it doesn't happen in every conflict and so why some places is, is it not happening um, and is it that those forces are more disciplined or you know it, is it because there's more women in the forces? For example, the Israeli Defence Force, um, it doesn't seem to happen um, very little anyway. Um, and that has a much higher percentage of, of women than in other armies. So I think trying to have more women participating in, um, in military is a really good thing as it is in every area and will perhaps change the, the culture a bit. Yeah, I think that that's, I think that's a really um, important point. It actually was a, a question I was going to go to, but you've, you've answered it. So another very difficult question. Uh, this is from Hannah Tooley. She says, how do you cope with the wrongs committed by men towards women without taking it out or being disappointed by men in general? <laughs> um, well, I have a very nice husband, <laughs> fortunately. So, um, no, because as I said, some of the people in the book who are, are heroes in this are, are men. So, you know, it doesn't mean that all men are, are yeah. bad guys. And it's you know some of the, like um, one of well several of the people that rescued a lot of the Yazidi girls were were men, including this um, beekeeper from um, Aleppo who says that he because he kept bees and saw that the queen bee how well organised the hives were and the society that that made him think about women's rights and why should their women be treated differently? So he risked his life rescuing hundreds of, of Yazidi women. So, um, so, you know, I think like everything, there are um, some bad people, but the majority of people are, are not. So I don't think you can, at the end of it, think, oh God, all, you know, <laughs> all men are awful. Um, it's, we need to look at why it's happening and, and in some of these cases I you know I talked about places really where it was used as a weapon of war so in some of these cases you know the men were ordered to do this it wasn't that they were just taking advantage they were told that this was their their right. duty to do it 
And then you also have interesting examples, for example, Nigeria, Boko Haram, some of the, the women that were taken by Boko Haram and forced to be their bushwives, actually when they were later rescued and um, were in camps, then said that they were, had been treated better by Boko Haram than they were being treated in, in the camps and um, went back. So it, it's not <laughs> black and white. Hi, Christina. Hi. Have There's a question coming in while Lindsay is uh, reconnecting again. A uh, couple of questions are coming in about, as a journalist, you having to hear the stories. Uh, how does that have an impact in your uh, mental health and, uh, um, and also having to take the survivors through yet uh, telling uh, the stories again? Uh, yeah. How does that make you feel? Okay, I mean, that is very important. The, the last thing you want to do is re-traumatize people, right, who have gone through these terrible things. And I was very concerned about that. So in all the cases, really, I went through like local organizations that were trying to help people or um, who had people that were willing to come forward and, and talk or were themselves um, taking legal action and so uh, were already speaking about it. So um, I didn't go and try and make people who uh, had been through these things and I didn't know. Um, I, I almost always knew before I went to speak to the people that they were um, going to talk about it and they wanted to talk about it so otherwise I think it would have been really difficult and actually this is something that I've thought about a lot doing this that you know we as journalists are often the first people that interview these very traumatized people for example when the Rohingya were coming over the border into Bangladesh and we were talking to them all and, and you know we're not trained actually to how we're not um, psychiatrists or therapists we're not trained how to to talk to these very um, damaged people and so I think it's something that is really important and something we need to think about a lot so I've actually been having meetings partly at Front Club, Frontline Club with people looking at whether we could draw up some kind of um, helpful advice and working with some of the survivors on what they think about how we should address it and I mean none of them say we don't want these stories to come out they do want to speak not of course not everybody wants to speak There's, there are people that that want to and but it's you know how you do it and that it's very much at their own pace I was lucky because I was doing a book it wasn't for news reports so I had plenty of time if people wanted to spend days telling me their story I could listen for days um, and I didn't have to rush people it could be where they wanted it to be the way they wanted it to be which I think is you know how it should be um, but I did worry about that a lot. Um, in terms of how it affected me, yeah, of course it, you know, it, it's not, it's a difficult thing to, to write about um, and to listen to. And I think what really just kept me going was really, I was so driven to want to try and change this and for people to know about it in order to try and um, get this, because I don't think it's so difficult, you know, we, we have justice systems, we have plenty of people that can go and, and help on this, and it, it's, you know, having a few, if you just had a few examples of where people were brought to justice for this, that it might start making a difference and people wouldn't be doing it on the, the same scale that they have been. Well, what about uh, the uh, the Me Too movement now and with the recent uh, yeah. things? Do you think that will have uh, a make a change or will have their influence for the future? 
Well, I think, you know, the Me Too movement is a great thing that it's, you know, um, changing the culture that um, many of us had sort of got used to and shouldn't have done. Um, but, you know, when I look back, when I started out as a, a young journalist and the newsroom where I worked, the news editor used to drop his trousers and moon at me when I walked in and I didn't know what to do. I was 21 year old trainee. And I mean, that's appalling. Now, I don't think young people today would ever accept that and shouldn't. Um, so I'm extremely glad that that has changed but I do think we need to realize that in a lot of these countries you know the Me Too movement it hasn't made any difference because these are people that don't have access to to lawyers or to to media or um, and are living in places where the perpetrators are actually running the country or running their area so the idea that they could kind of speak out about what's happened to them and these people have guns right <laughs> they're not um so it's extremely hard and i think that we need to um really try and and speak out about that that you know the me too movement uh needs to be reaching these places too it's not it's been much too much as kind of western um movement i think I, I'm back in again after coming in and out because you know there's another very good question. You and Grant here. Want to know what the response has been to your book? Has there been any particularly surprising response? Have have people shied away from your book because it's so painful, or have people embraced it? Well, I was worried about that. That you know, and the reviews, although um, have been very good, <laughs> have been very you know most people have said this is really difficult to read so you don't necessarily particularly at a time like this where I think people probably want something pleasurable to think about um, it's um, to write a book that is hard for people to read but I do think that there is a lot of as I said um, people in it that it's not all doom and gloom that there are lots of examples where people are doing things and where a difference is being made and also, I don't think that because something's difficult to read that, or hear about that we should ignore it. I think, you know, you, you need to know why have we gone for so many years without talking about these issues? You know, when I studied history at school, I didn't know anything about any of this. There was never any discussion about what happened to to women in, in war, either from, you know, how they were often the people holding things together to this, this kind of brutality. And so I think it's, you know, time now in 2020 that we actually um, look at these issues and try and make a difference. Maybe the saddest thing in a way, but also very moving was going to the Philippines and talking to some of the last surviving comfort women who were taken when they were 13 or 14 um, sometimes, you know, not even started their periods by Japanese soldiers and forced to have sex with these soldiers and kept in these so-called comfort stations. Um, and to this day, this is 70, more than 70 years ago, they still haven't had justice. Not only that, they didn't even have acknowledgement of what happened to them. It's not in the history books in their mm. schools. They... Um, campaign to have a, a statue um, erected in Manila on the bay for um, recognizing the comfort women and it stayed there about four months and then it was removed um, and you know this isn't right that these women what they've been through we need to acknowledge what happened to them they should be apologized to they should get justice so one of the questions um, from Ali Criado Perez here is what can what practical action could people take what can people who are listening here do if anything i mean first of all you know be so just the fact that they're listening and it's great that people are interested and aware and maybe then tell other people about it and that we make sure that 
it's not neglected anymore that when we talk about what happens in war whether as reporters or historians i mean one of the things anthony beaver said which was interesting to me was that um because military history has mostly been written by men right, until apart from margaret Macmillan, and and he was saying it's not possible anymore to write the history, the military account of what happened in a place without talking about what happens to women. And he also interestingly yeah. said that when he does his research, always the best diaries of what was going on were by the women. So, um, so you know, that's changing. I think the history um, now is bringing in, we're not neglecting. And again, you know, I emphasize that we're talking about quite recent history. I mean, talking mm. about Franco times in, in Spain and things where we just didn't know what was happening to the women. In my book, I talk about what happened in Argentina during the, the dirty war in the eighties or late seventies and early eighties. And, you know, I had no idea that um, lots of women had been um, kept as sex slaves by the military and that there had been widespread rape. And only now there's starting to be cases about that. But that was hidden for a long time. And that's very interesting because those women um, who were picked up because they were considered to be you know, left wing subversives um, were mostly... Um, women like us, they were educated, feisty women. They were the kind of women that did have uh, the means and access to lawyers and media. And yet even they didn't speak out for so many years about what happened. So it shows how difficult this issue. So I think there's a long way around of saying, you know, people talking about it, it needs to be something that um, isn't ignored anymore. And pressure also put on, our politicians, although they're going to be very distracted by other things now, but to um, really ensure that justice is done and that the International Criminal Court must be um, taking this more seriously and not anymore saying the real issue is the, the killing and the torture, because this needs to be addressed just in the same way. I totally agree with you. Before we wind up, I've got a question here which is very specifically for you, Christina, but not on this issue, because some people know that you have recently become a television star as well, because of a bit of a cameo appearance, as I recall. Is this <laughs> not right? Sense. A cameo appearance in Homeland. So somebody here, who may, I don't know if James Hayworth is known to you, he asked, how realistic do you think the Homeland TV series is compared to your experiences on the edge of the military all over the world and in Afghanistan. Well, you were there in Homeland. Just <laughs> tell us a little bit. Actually, I tried to be helpful to them in my, my one day on set and they um, had a, a scene in the Afghan defense minister's office. So I had been in the Afghan defense minister's office a number of times. So I pointed out that it wasn't really quite like the office that they had designed which I don't think they really appreciated um, so um, how realistic um, yeah it, I mean it's a, a TV show it's um, I don't think that it there are a lot of things that are very different to the reality of what is going on in Afghanistan today or indeed after 9-11 but um but it's good tv she's brilliant <laughs> Claire Dane, and, what, and we don't know how much longer it's going to be before we can travel again and go back to the reporting we did before is anything going to change? Do you think in a year's time you and I will, you know, meet somewhere in the Middle East or in South Asia um, reporting as we always have done? Or do you think that what is happening now with coronavirus is going to, to change what we do as foreign correspondents? It's really difficult to know at the moment, I think, because we don't know, you know, it's obviously if they come up with some kind of vaccine or cure, that will completely change everything. But that looks like it's going to be a, a long process. So I do think that we will have um, quite a long period where we're going to have to 
do things very differently. I mean, at the moment, I don't even know how you would fly somewhere or, you know, to go to places where there are crowds of people. Um, it's going to be really difficult. I mean, we're all at the moment trying to report through talking to people like we're doing now virtually, and it's amazing the technology, but it is not the same as being there. Mm -hmm. um, and also, the sort of, you know, the conversations that you have, anyone who's watching this, whether they're journalists or aid workers or just interested in this, you all know that, you know, that often the most interesting things are when you, you know, having. Uh, a conversation in a bar with somebody after interviews or mm. you know not so when you're restricted to just doing things on a sort of formal basis on a screen it's just not the same and um yeah so I don't know what do you no. think do you think things are going to well look I hope that I hope that we will be able to fly again and, and go to, to places. I suppose my worry is that people's reserves of compassion will be exhausted because of you know, what they're going through now with you know, illness and death in their own families, but also unemployment and economic hardship. And so, I, you know, economic hardship, war, contagion these are things that we have reported on in lots of other countries and i think it will be hard to get people's attention or maybe there is a sense in which people will understand more and that's the way we're going to have to report more more cleverly in that way and make the connections more than we've managed to do in the past maybe yeah i mean one of the things that um gives me hope is that having spent a lot of time as you have in these places you think because often people say how can you go to all those bad places and not kind of go mad and the thing is that people are so resilient and it just endlessly astonishes me when you go to places mm. like Aleppo under siege or Afghanistan where they've had like 40 years of war and yet you find people doing incredible things in all those places so I do think that that gives us some hope and we're seeing that a bit here you know you are seeing people doing remarkable things people do so I started like I have on my Facebook page I post some stories about some of the people I've met in places doing um inspiring things to just show you know that even in really bad places and bad times that actually you know good things can come out of it and it's also interesting seeing some of the same things happening here like I wrote about the how in Sarajevo lots of people started um, growing vegetables and things in window boxes during the siege there and and then I mean I wrote that and then a few days later there was an article here about you know how window how everybody was buying plants and um, yes. spending lots of time in their gardens and growing so there are you know the same kind of things happening in, in in different places that does give me hope and the other thing that i mean i guess i don't know about you but i've always been amazed how people in these situations adapt and how what you would think what would i be like and again i go back to sorry but it always seems to be like the women who are keeping families together under siege and um and I've always been so impressed by that. And now suddenly, you know, our reality changed almost overnight. And yeah. you do adapt. You do. I mean, who imagined a few weeks ago that, you know, you would only be able to go out for a short time each day, that it would feel risky going to a supermarket, that you would see so many people wearing masks, that you'd cross the road to avoid being near other people. I mean, you'd have thought you were mad if somebody had said that a month or so ago but two months ago christina we i've been told that i have to bring it to an end by 16 15 but we got now i can't hold up your book because i've only got a proof copy so can you just hold up the book so people can <laughs> see because they should buy it yeah our, our bodies their battlefield what war <laughs> does to women it's a really i'm not going to tell you it's an easy read but it's really beautifully written it's Thank it's you. a very good book it's a very important book so thank you very much christina lamb and thank you pranvera for uh putting this on and the frontline club 
Uh, no thanks to my internet providers, because I <laughs> was the person going up and down. And Sanvera says that um, we're going, right, so the next Thursday's event um, in the Keep Calm and Carry On line, so the Frontline Club, is going to be coverage of coronavirus. And it's going to have John Sweeney, mad as a hatter, Professor David Heyman and Craig Oliver, who, Craig Oliver used to be an editor at Channel 4 News, so he went to be David Cameron's spin doctor. So um, that's going to be an interesting um, event. So do all please join the Frontline Club then. And thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. Thank you. Thanks for coming along.